Coming up, the Fed hikes rates. How will it impact tech? Lightspeed Venture Partners Jeremy Liu joins us with his take and potential shockwaves to the ecosystem. Plus, it's game on this week in LA. We are live from E3, the biggest video game conference of the year, with execs from Nintendo and Take Two. And after Tim Cook tells us Apple is focusing on autonomous tech and its push into cars, the competition is taking notice. But first, to our lead, Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen forged ahead with an interest rate hike along with additional plans to tighten monetary policy despite growing concerns over weak inflation. Now that capital is more costly to reel in, how will it impact the tech ecosystem, specifically venture capitalists, and how could that trickle down to tech startups? Joining us now from New York, longtime venture capitalist Jeremy Liu of Lightspeed Venture Partners and also the first VC investor in SNAP. Jeremy, great to have you back. Hi, it's so, good to see you. Fed officials raising rates. This is the third time in six months. We're looking for another one uh, later this year. How does this impact venture capital? Well, you know, micro always trumps the macro when you're thinking about venture capital because we're always looking at these really early stage companies. So the cost of capital or, or you know, uh, Fed rate hikes, I think a lot less important than things like, do we believe in the team? Do we believe in their vision? Do they have a unique insight? Do we think that they can build something that's going to create new habits for people. At the same time, SoftBank just raised almost $100 billion to invest in tech. I know it's later stage, but there is so much capital built up in the system. How does that change the competitive landscape for you? you know, when you're talking about that much money, it really is the latest stage companies that are, um, that are going to be affected. And in, in some instances, those financings are almost um, a substitute for, for a public offering. At the earliest stages, uh, it's just impossible for a company to put $100 billion to work one or two or $5 million at a time. So do you see an impact on valuations longer term? I, th I don't think so. Um, I think for over the next uh, few years, really, we're going to continue to see the fundamentals of the micro, so the team and the quality idea and technology changes that create new disruptions and new waves of companies. That's going to be a much bigger impact on valuations and opportunities than, than anything else. Speaking of, you were the first venture capital investor in Snap. Uh, Snap shares are near their lows. Can they fend off this competition from Instagram? Do you see innovation in the pipeline? I think that one of the things that Snap has really done a terrific job of in the last few months has been to continue to focus on its vision of being a camera company. And that idea of um, you know, additional functionality through the camera, AR, uh, both outward looking lenses and inward looking lenses is something they've continued to, to push forward uh, since the public offering. The other thing they've done a really good job of is make it easier for companies to spend money on them. Um, so advertisers are finding more ways uh, and easier ways to spend money on them. And so those are two really important factors that I think are going to continue to drive the value of the company. That said, there are user growth issues, especially abroad. Do you think they can reaccelerate user growth? If so, how? You know, Evan's been consistent in talking about uh, a focus on the developed world markets uh, where the opportunities for advertising are the greatest. And I think that that's, uh, the, the behavior of the company has been very consistent with what he's always talked about. You and I last spoke, Jeremy, when we were trying out Snap Spectacles. You were sharing your pair with me. You were very bullish on them. It seems, though, they, they haven't really gained the traction some people expected. What are your thoughts? I mean, sell side analysts are lowering their expectations. Yeah, you know, at the time, Evan characterized um, the spectacles as a toy. And uh, I think it re you should really think about it in the context of Snap as a camera company. And it's going to continue to make uh, more experiments and, and try to figure out different ways that it can engage with users. Uh, recently, it bought a drone company, for example. And so I think you're going to see more and more interesting uh, new product launches in the, in the months and, and quarters ahead. When it comes to other exciting consumer-facing investments, that is, is really your focus. And I wonder, are you seeing opportunities out there? Are you seeing the next Snapchat? Or, or is there a drought in terms of the pipeline? You know, we believe that consumer technology has become popular culture. 
And because of that, um, the key driver is not the technology itself, but rather the unique insight into consumer behavior uh, that can precipitate a new company. And so we're seeing that disseminated from not just Silicon Valley, but now you're seeing companies with those insights, whether it be in New York or in LA uh, or anywhere in between. I've been to you know, Arkansas to visit companies. I've been to Illinois. I've been to um, Tennessee. And so you know, one of the things that we're excited about is that that democratization of entrepreneurship, um, because it's so much easier to build an app now or to set up an e-commerce site, is, is generating a whole new uh, wave of interesting companies. Now, Lightspeed partnered with Apple on its foray into original content, the show Planet of the Apps. It did get some mixed reviews, so why should viewers give this show a shot? Well, one of the things that I think is really compelling about the show is that for this new generation of entrepreneurs, if you are in Chattanooga, Tennessee, for example, and you're interested in building an app, you don't necessarily have a good view into the Silicon Valley ecosystem, what it means to raise capital, what sort of questions you might be asked, how you should be thinking about market size or competition. The last 20 minutes of each episode gives people a fantastic view into what it's like to engage with a venture capital firm because we made investments in more than a dozen companies over the course of the 10 episodes and it gives people an opportunity to be a fly on the wall and watch exactly what those conversations look like. Where did we pay attention? Where did we ask for questions? for more information, and where were we okay with risk? So for an entrepreneur anywhere in the country who's thinking about uh, wanting to raise capital to really realize the, the, the huge opportunity, it's gonna give them almost like a dry run as to what that's gonna look like. All right, can't wait to give it a watch. Lightspeed Ventures partner, Jeremy Liu, thank you so much for joining us. U.S. President Donald Trump has announced his intent to nominate Jessica Rosenworcel to fill the open Democratic slot at the Federal Communications Commission. Rosenworcel served as a commissioner for the FCC until the end of 2016, when lawmakers failed to take up her renomination under former President Obama. The agency is currently working to reverse Obama-era regulations, including the landmark 2015 net neutrality rules. Rosenworcel backed the net neutrality rules in 2015 and put a significant focus on the plight of children without access to broadband service. Coming up, we head to E3, the biggest gaming event of the year, where Nintendo is revealing new titles for its Switch console. Our interview with Nintendo America President Reggie fils is next. And Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV, weekdays 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. A story we are watching, Harvard University longtime president Drew Faust is stepping down next year, effective June 30th, 2018. Faust, who spent more than a decade at the helm of the Ivy League, was the first woman to lead the university. She is credited with leading a capital campaign that raised over $8 billion for Harvard, but her tenure was also marked by financial difficulties, with the university's endowment losing almost 30% of its value in 2009 following the global credit crisis. Faust spoke with Bloomberg Caroline Hyde last month from Harvard's campus in Cambridge and discussed her vision for bringing the university into the future. If you're going to be a citizen of the 21st century, you need to understand technology. So we've tried to cast a very broad and open gate. And I feel that often in the past, science studies challenge people by saying kind of, if you're not going to be Einstein, you don't belong here, and we're going to flunk everybody out, and, and we're going to make it really impossible for you to succeed. We have a completely opposite attitude, which is, come, try this out. We want to give you a path to succeeding in this, because we think it's so important. Now to the biggest video game conference of the year, E3 is underway in LA this week. Among the biggest announcements, the highly anticipated hardware updates from Microsoft with its Xbox One X, and on the software front, Nintendo in particular, stirring up serious attention about games to come on its newest game console, unveiling Pokemon and Metroid to the gaming lineup for Switch. Nintendo has risen more than 40% since the debut of the Switch, and joining us now from the E3 conference, Nintendo America President, Reggie fils -Aimé. Reggie, great to have you back here on the show. So when are these new games coming to the Switch console? 
So we've got a great lineup of new games coming to the Nintendo Switch console, starting with this Friday, a brand new franchise called ARMS. We're going to be hosting an ARMS competitive tournament here right at our booth. But the highlight of our offerings is a new Super Mario game, Super Mario Odyssey, launching on October 27th. The lines have been around our booth. The consumers have big smiles on their faces. So things are going well for us here at E3. So there was a lack of third-party gaming announcements. Should we expect other games to be announced later this year? You know, so we announced here at E3 a number of different games for Nintendo Switch. We've got a new game called Splatoon 2 coming later on this summer. There's a franchise called Xenoblades Chronicles that we've announced a new addition in, in that game coming later on this fall. We've announced well in development. We've got a new Metroid game, as you mentioned, as well as new Pokemon core RPG games coming to the franchise. So we've got a wealth of games. Plus, there's great third-party games coming as well, games from EA, from Bethesda, from Ubisoft. There's a lot of content coming, not only for Nintendo Switch, but for Nintendo 3DS as well. Microsoft and Sony are going head-to-head -head on consoles. Why stay out of the race for the fattest, hottest console on the market? You know, it's interesting. You know, our two competitors believe that it's all about processing power and beautiful graphics. Candidly, Nintendo believes in fun. Our content brings smiles to people's faces. We enable grandparents to play with their grandkids. Our content focuses on a fun, enjoyable experience. So for us, the technology really is a small part of what we deliver. We deliver smiles and we deliver fun. Mobile gaming continues to be a big growth driver for you. What are the lessons you've learned from Mario on the iPhone? You know, it's interesting. Super Mario Run on the iPhone as well as Android. You know, we are selling this application in games that have never been uh, able to enjoy Nintendo content before. Countries like India, China, Korea, all of these markets are enjoying this application, which means that Mario is reaching new types of consumers. We also launched a game called Fire Emblem Heroes. This is a game that's doing exceptionally well, continues to be in the top of the charts for Android as well as iOS. So what we've learned is how to bring our content to smart devices, how to do it effectively, how to monetize it, and that bodes well for our future efforts, including our next application, which will be in the Animal Crossing franchise. Apple CEO Tim Cook visited Japan last year. He visited Nintendo's offices. How did that visit go? It went incredibly well. So this visit happened as we were doing the planning for the launch of Super Mario Run. We had our key game developer, Shigeru Miyamoto, there at an Apple conference about a year ago. So what we've, what we've been able to foster is a very strong relationship with Apple, a strong relationship with uh, Google and Android as well. But I, I think what we offer these marketplaces is a type of content that consumers love, that consumers have fond memories of in terms of the intellectual properties. And that's important to them, and those relationships are important to us as well. When can we expect mobile games to be a majority of Nintendo's revenue? You know, Emily, that's a great question. You know, today, the vast majority of our revenues are driven by our dedicated games business. Mobile is important to us, but mobile is only one of two other key, uh, key platforms for us as we think about our growth. The relationship that we're doing with other companies in the broader entertainment space like Universal Studios is also going to be important to us from a long-term growth perspective. And I would say also what we're doing in the licensed merchandise area, you know, like the shirt I'm wearing, enable consumers to, to show off their love for our IP. That's going to be an important growth driver. These are all of the different areas that Nintendo is going to continue to drive revenue and profitability well into the future. You've got more than $8 billion in cash on your balance sheet. Do you plan to use it on M&A? You know, for us, it all depends on the opportunity and how we can do something that would structurally add value to the business. We're fortunate. We've been a highly profitable company. We are sitting on some cash. We're not eager to make any type of move, but to the extent that it can help us drive our strategic focus areas, certainly there's always a possibility. And what about virtual reality? We've talked about this over the years. How bullish are you on VR now? So here's what's interesting. Here at this show, I would say the amount of virtual reality content being shown this year versus last year is dramatically down. 
we've said all along that virtual reality needs to be fun and it needs to be social, and it really hasn't been able to do either of those things yet. In our view, we think that augmented reality is, a, is potentially a more interesting space, obviously Pokemon Go, and what that did in the augmented reality space was very important to our company. So we're continuing to look at all of these technologies and see how they apply to our business. But in the, in the realm of virtual reality, we're, con, we're continuing to really just evaluate whether or not this is going to be an important trend for the consumer. All right, Nintendo America President Reggie fils May, thank you as always for stopping by. Coming up, one of the biggest unicorns in Europe is going after Uber, rolling out new ride-sharing products. We'll hear from the founder of Blah Blah Car next. And a feature I'd like to bring to your attention, our new interactive TV function. You can find it at TV Go on the Bloomberg. You can watch us live. And if you miss an interview, you can go back to it. You can send our producers a message. You can play along with the charts that we show you on air. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Check it out at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. A story we are watching, wind and solar energy accounted for more than 10% of U.S. power generation in March, marking a new record level. According to the Energy Information Administration, wind farms accounted for 8% of electricity generation, while residential and commercial solar installations made up the other 2%. After President Trump pulled the U.S. out of the Paris Climate Accord, tech firms like Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google, along with hundreds of other companies, pledged to move forward with their commitments to reduce carbon carbon emissions and push for renewable energy. In France, car sharing startup Blah Blah Car has been growing rapidly, expanding in more than 20 countries to let more drivers split the cost of long distance trips with passengers. Now the French unicorn is starting to trial short distance trips for daily commutes throughout the country. Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde joins us now from London with more. Caroline, what did he have to say? Yeah, Emily, hi. And I spoke to Frederick Mazzella, Blah Blah Car founder, and he visited us in London. And we discussed the startup's rapid growth and the tech scene in France. It uh, depends on the countries, but we see some countries surprisingly go super fast. Uh, we have a community today of 45 million members in more than 20 countries. Uh, some countries like uh, Russia are incredible in terms of growth. Uh, we see that Russia is now uh, becoming the country in which you have the most people carpooling. Uh, and so it, it's incredible to see, uh, to see it uh, becoming really uh, democratized. 45 million, put that in perspective for us. That's a um, phenomenal number. That represents roughly uh, 12 million people traveling with blah blah car every quarter. And uh, to give you a sense of scale, uh, British Airways has 10 million passengers per quarter, which means we actually have on blah blah car more people traveling than uh, British Airways. Wow, okay. And so as you scale, as we see interesting countries like Russia, continuing to pick up pace. What sort of innovations are you seeing? What sort of new ways? Because Blah Blah Car set itself apart by the fact that it is ride sharing, but over very long distances, distances you might usually take a train, but you're adapting that model a little. Yeah, we're innovating always. Just because you're successful on your uh, core activity doesn't mean you should not explore new initiatives and make innovations and uh, try some experimentations. So uh, this year we've tried two things already, uh, which are at first, uh, we provide our members a way to acquire a car in a leasing mode for a very attractive price. Thanks to the volume of the community, we have lots of people who buy cars every year, so we were able to have a deal with ALD and Opel, which is very interesting for our members. Uh, you can lease a car on four or five years, and uh, you'll get a super good price just because you are a member of Blah Blah Car. So it's reserved for what we call the ambassadors, who are the uh, best users today. Is and that international, or is that it, largely in For France? now, it's a pilot operation that is launched in France, and we will expand it. Uh, when it is uh, successful. And we've also launched a new product called uh, Blah Blah Lines, which is for shorter distances. So commute trips, basically, the, the trips you'll do in the morning and at night to go to work. And uh, the, the goal is to get uh, more frequency and a usage which is more casual uh, on, on a daily basis. Blah Blah's home is France. Talk to us about the tech scene there, because we have Technology Week in London upon us and very much trying to sing out the praises of a particular hub, but what is the hub like in Paris and the rest of France? Well, the first, time, the first thing I would like to say is that 
next year we should synchronize because having the London Tech Week and uh, the Tech Week as we have in France with uh, lots of events as well right now at the same moment, the same week, is not very convenient for <laughs> us as Europeans when we travel everywhere. Uh, we have to travel during the same week and it's kind of uh, complicated for a lot of people in my uh, environment. Note, but, note to organizers, yes, spit them up. I think next week up. we need to synchronize and have one London Tech Week and then the next week in France or the reverse, uh, maybe before in France. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And um, so it, it, it's actually a booming ecosystem. You have a new leader, a new party, a young dynamic Macron, and indeed seemingly a legislature that's going to be on his side. Do you think that sort of political stability will make things even better or does it really not matter what the political environment's like? Well, it's, it's very early to tell. Uh, what I'm very proud of is that we've been able to vote for change and to vote for a young president. This is obviously sending a message that we're ready for the next decade or for the next few years uh, to really change things and make them better. Optimistic there. That was some of our conversation with Blah Blah Car founder Frederick Matzella. Emily. Caroline Hyde in London. Thanks so much. Coming up, wrong move, says our next guest on Uber CEO Travis Kalanick taking a leave of absence from the company he co founded. We'll hear from Mona's Crespi Heart analyst James Chalkmach next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg radio at Bloomberg.com and in the US on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. In London, the death toll from that massive apartment tower fire is up to 12, and authorities still expect it to rise. Dozens of people were injured, and several were hospitalized in critical condition. Police say the fire broke out around the second floor of the 24-story Grenfell Tower shortly after midnight. Ireland's new prime minister, Leo Varadkar, took office today, the son of an Indian immigrant. He is the first openly gay politician to serve in that post and also the youngest. He replaces Enda Kenny, who resigned. Also in Ireland, Pashel Donahoe was appointed finance minister. He replaces Michael Noonan. Germany expects the schedule for Brexit negotiations to remain in place despite the outcome of the UK election. A spokesperson for Chancellor Merkel says officials have no indication that anything will change. British Prime Minister Theresa May is working to reach a deal with Northern Ireland's Democratic Unionist Party after losing her majority in Parliament. Cuba is starting an electoral process expected to end with President Raul Castro stepping down. Castro has said he'll resign as president in February, although he is expected to remain head of the ruling Communist Party. Officials say voting for municipal assemblies will be in October. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti, and this is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. Wednesday here in Washington, 7.30 Thursday morning now in Sydney. We are joined by Bloomberg's Paul Allen, and he's got a look at the markets. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Elisa. Well, we're seeing some weakness for Nikkei futures and the ASX futures off about a sixth of 1%. Uh, we may see gold stocks leading the decline after gold weakened on that uh, news of the Fed tightening. Uh, jobs data is the one to watch out of Australia today. The unemployment rate expected to hold steady at 5.7%, although that read is always notoriously unpredictable. Uh, one stock to watch over the next couple of days is the world's biggest miner, BHP. It's expected to name a new chairman either today 
or tomorrow uh, to replace Jack Nasser, who announced he would be stepping down last October. Uh, Elliott Management's been pressuring BHP uh, to unload its U.S. shale assets, among other things. Other things to watch today. The New Zealand dollar uh, will be in focus with first quarter GDP out of New Zealand in just about an hour's time. That's expected to rise to seven-tenths of one percent off the back of a pretty disappointing balance of payments read on Wednesday. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. After the worst sell-off this year for tech stocks, the market is still trying to find its footing. The companies that saw the biggest losses at the start of the week fell once again in the session after the Federal Reserve meeting. But even after the $176 billion wipeout in market value we've seen since Friday, are tech stocks still too expensive? That's the question a lot of investors are asking right now. I want to bring in James Chalkmock, analyst at Monas Crespi and Hart, who covers big cap tech companies like Facebook, Google, and Amazon. Great to have right. you here in the studio Thank today. You. So, are they too expensive? I don't, I don't. I don't think you can make that argument right now. Um, I mean, yes, they are more expensive than than the trough valuations that we have seen. But at the same time, the growth rates that we're seeing right now are actually superior to the growth rates that we saw previously when the, when the multiples were lower. So you can make the argument uh, that the valuations are justified. I mean, if you look at Facebook and Google, for example, the PE multiples are about 10 percent higher, but the growth rates are about five, 10 percent faster. So what's behind the sell-off? The sell-off, what we think, and what we're seeing, I was talking to our desk, is more quant-driven, what you saw last Friday and what you saw on Monday. Now, you're not seeing a fundamental institutional selling uh, at these levels right now. But I do think as you look forward, you know, you do potentially have, uh, now I'm not a market strategist, but yeah, but the potential for a broader market sell-off, because a lot of what was baking in into 18 estimates and 19 was with the Trump trade, a lot of these bills passing through. And we're seeing delay after delay after delay. And if it doesn't happen, what happens to the estimates? You know, when you think about tax and so forth. So you see more bumps in the road ahead for tech stocks, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Google, I think Microsoft. If you have the long enough horizon, I think, um, I think it's justified right now, uh, even, even with the uh, valuations a little bit higher. But right now, I'm neutral on a lot of these names, Amazon uh, and Facebook specifically. Google is the only one right now that we see where the risk-reward trade-off makes a very easy sense. Why? Because the valuation is cheap, <laughs> and relatively. I mean, we're talking about around 10 times EBITDA, and you're growing around revenue around 20% like clockwork with all these new opportunities in the days ahead. You put out a note on Uber earlier this week saying you expected Travis Kalanick to stay on. Right. He has <laughs> since resigned. It's, it's been a dramatic yeah. couple of days. Excuse me, he's taken a leave of absence, sure. an indefinite leave of absence. What's your reaction? I mean, in fairness, in the note, I did caveat, I could be wrong on this today. <laughs> so I was wrong only one day later. Um, but, I mean, look, the, way, the reason we thought he would stay is because they were able to hire two top lieutenants, even with him there, um, on the leadership side and on the, uh, on the branding, consumer branding side. So that was a positive. And at the same time, you have to think about it, the business, from what we understand, is doing extremely well, even with all these hiccups in the... Uh, that they, more than hiccups, that's an understatement. Um, Pretty big hiccups. Very, very, very big hiccups, um, mountains that they're trying to, you know, climb over. But at the end of the day, the business was doing well. So if Travis does leave, I think the case can be made that why do we need Travis? Because if business will continue to do well since it's such early days, you know, I think he might lose some leverage. So um, I, I can tell you that in, at least employees are probably uh, more inclined to think that he will come back. What are the chances that he actually returns? Well, <laughs> I, I'm personally handicapping it, it against them coming back, but at least from what I hear, um, the, the sentiment is otherwise. Now, David Bonderman of TPG, longtime board member at Uber, as yeah. the Eric Holder report was being read out to employees, he made an off-color remark uh, along the lines of women talk more at board meetings, right. which, by the way, studies show is not true. Men talk more at board meetings, according to the research. He has resigned. How much hope do you have, if these issues are coming from the top down like this, how much hope do you have that the culture at Uber can be improved? 
Look, the, the good news is that, I, from what I hear, at least this is the first time that employees have started to feel much better about mm -hmm. the prospects from the, the commentary that HR has been making, the new HR lead there. Um, but at the same time, you can see that this is not a Travis-specific issue. You know, this is a much more uh, a fundamental issue across all levels of the company, board level on down to your engineers. So um, I think that there is hope that, look, everyone can change. Um, as long as you, uh, you know, you address it, you identify it, and you take the appropriate steps to fix it, I mean, why, why can't they improve? So, you're positive about the future of Uber's business, right. with or without him. Do you see Uber sustaining that seventy billion dollar valuation? I think right now, um, I think it's, it could potentially take a hit in the in the near term because. Yes, even though we're putting all this behind us, you know, there's still a lot of, you know, headline risk uh, associated with it. And at the same time, you have to think about the fact that they don't even have any leadership in place and you still have massive employer attrition. Uh, so I think until those are fully behind them, you can't justify a valuation, you know, at least higher than what, we, what we've seen historically. All right. James Chalkmock, analyst at Mos Monas Crespi and Hart. Right. Always great to have you here on the show. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you. Coming up, Apple joins the race to develop autonomous tech in its push into cars. How the competition is bracing itself. This is Bloomberg. How do you walk that line when you're in the middle of a crisis situation? It's really all about enabling people. Technology needs to serve everyone. But at the end of the day, it's all about emotional decision. I think there's huge innovation left in music. The hallmark of a truly great leader is that great is never great enough. For us, it's not about being first. It's about being the best. Instagram is trying to make it clear to users when influencer posts are paid ads. In doing so, the social platform will let users who work with sponsors decide to tag a brand within their post. If the brand confirms the relationship, the post will be marked as an ad with a paid partnership tag at the top. The product is being tested now with a handful of businesses and celebrities and will be rolled out more widely if it's successful. Now back to our coverage of E3, the biggest video game conference of the year. While movie and TV studios continue to be disrupted by new forms of digital entertainment, video game companies have come through looking like winners. And if you look inside my Bloomberg, you can see that investors are bidding up on these video game stocks on prospects for rising profit with Take-Two at the top. We caught up with CEO Strauss Zelnick and asked what exactly is driving video game stocks? Take a listen. There are a couple of things driving the growth in not only the price of our stock, but some of our competitors. And the first is that I think the, the promise of the business is beginning to be translated into the reality of how these companies are doing, uh, ours included. And the promise has been that interactive entertainment is the most rapidly growing part of the entertainment business. It has been for some time. And with a cohort of consumers, it's now about 37 years old on average and skewing only slightly more male than female. There's plenty of more growth in the population ahead. We also have the explosion of new gen platforms. About 85 million of them are out there. And we expect that to nearly double in just the next few years, the launch of Nintendo Switch. And most importantly, the, the ongoing engagement of consumers in between big releases, what we call recurrent consumer spending. Consumers aren't only buying big video games now, they're staying engaged in the products they love, and we and our competitors are able to monetize that engagement. Some of the biggest announcements at this year's E3, Microsoft's new powerful console, the success of Sony's PlayStation 4, how are you positioning yourself for these announcements? Well, these, these machines are backward compatible, so they're, they're effective for titles that are tailored for them. They're also uh, playable for titles that are already in the market. I think every time that there's more technical room for our creative folks to express themselves, they're excited by that opportunity, and uh, we pride ourselves on making the, the, the most deep, the most immersive, and the highest quality experiences in the business. So having 
um, having sort of a, a more exciting and deeper canvas on which to paint is always good news for us. Big news from Take Two recently was the delay of Red Dead Redemption 2. What's the reason for that delay? At the, at the end of the day, we are always trying to put out the highest quality titles in the marketplace. And, and while um, it's always difficult to, to slip a title, when our development teams feel that more time is required to deliver the best possible experience, um, then that's, that's the decision that, that's made. And it's, it's paid off for us over and over again. At the end of the day, we are in the business of delivering the highest quality titles to the market. NBA 2K continues to grow, but there's a chance that EA is going to bring back NBA Live this year. How concerned are you about renewed competition? We're, uh, we're always looking over our shoulder. We don't take anything for granted. I'm fond of saying that arrogance is the enemy of continued success. Uh, our NBA title, uh, NBA 2K17, is the highest rated sports title of new generation consoles. Uh, we're really proud of that. We've sold in nearly 8 million units of the title. Our uh, recurrent consumer spending on NBA is up about 70% year over year. So there's a lot to be proud of. Our development folks would also tell you there's a lot more that we can do. And, uh, and we believe that the title that's coming up this fall is going to be nothing short of extraordinary. Now, Strauss, you and I have talked about the prospects of virtual reality over the years, and you've taken very much a wait-and-see approach. What are the biggest challenges that you see that still remain to virtual reality going mainstream? Well, I think, uh, you know, I was sort of an outlier in expressing uh, some concerns about whether uh, virtual reality would be an appropriate market for the entertainment business. I think we can establish that it's very exciting technology for military uses, for healthcare, potentially. For entertainment, there are some challenges. We've put out a title for VR, Carnival Games. We have had an NBA experience. The market is still small for us and for our competitors. Uh, that said, if there is a market, if there is an install base, if consumers want VR experiences, we stand ready and we have the technical abilities and I think the creative interest to bring those titles to the market. Um, I, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical. Why are you skeptical? The, the notion, there, there are any number of issues with regard to what is currently a VR experience. The notion of wearing a vision and hearing occluding headset, uh, the fact that therefore the experience is pretty solitary, uh, the fact that it can create uh, what those in the industry call discomfort, uh, as others of us call it nausea. Uh, th there are all kinds of problems associated with the current technology that make it somewhat inconsistent with the way people consume entertainment and specifically interactive entertainment. That was Take Two CEO Strauss Zelnick there from E3. And here's the chart on the Bloomberg that I mentioned earlier. Take Two outperforming the broader market there in the yellow. That's Activision in blue, EA in white, video game stocks in general, though, on the rise over the last year. And a quick programming note, this Thursday, Cisco Chair John Chambers will join Bloomberg Daybreak Americas from the Viva Tech Conference in Paris for an exclusive interview. This is Bloomberg. Automakers are seeking permission to put more experimental self-driving cars on the road to speed up development. Car companies like Ford, GM, and Toyota are asking Congress to expand the cap on how many cars can be deployed under waivers from safety regulators. This according to the Alliance of Automobile Manufacturers. The automakers are also asking Congress to clarify state and federal oversight roles and update vehicle regulations that implicitly require a human driver. And speaking of self-driving cars, after years toiling away in secret on a car project, Apple CEO Tim Cook for the first time elaborated on the company's plans in the automotive market in our exclusive interview. Take a listen. Autonomy is something that's incredibly uh, exciting for us. And uh, but we'll, we'll see where it takes us. We're not really saying from a product point of view what we're what we will do. We're, but we are being uh, straightforward that it's a core technology that we view as very important. 
Our interview with Cook spurred commentary and research notes from auto editors and analysts alike, and other auto players in the autonomous car race are taking notice. Cox Automotive Senior Director of Content and Executive Publisher Carl Brower joins us now. Cox Automotive is the parent company of the brand's Kelly Blue Book and Auto Trader. Carl, thank you so much for joining us. So Cook's comments, the most detailed yet, but still high level and still somewhat vague. Uh, what do you think this could lead to from a product perspective at Apple? I think eventually it could lead to the Apple car that we've all been thinking about and hearing for you know five years, different rumors. I think in the near term, it's more likely to lead to collaboration between Apple and current car makers, similar to what Waymo, which is part of Google, is already doing. Uh, and I do think you could easily see a world where just like our phones are all, almost all either Androids or Apple phones, we could have a, a circumstance where our cars uh, technology, especially the autonomous versions of these cars, are all powered by either Apple or Google based uh, technology and operating systems. So as Apple potentially goes to market, do you see them partnering with a manufacturer, licensing technology to a manufacturer, or likely, more likely coming to market with a car of its own? I think probably all three in sequence. I think that they'll partner with an automaker and start to help them power their own autonomous vehicle systems for their cars. And eventually, they could become a final uh, you know, producer, a final holder of car design that the automakers make for them, essentially making the automakers a tier one supplier for Apple. There are two mobile operating systems that are dominant, iOS and Android. Do you, do you see the same for cars or more? That's a great question. I think that we could end up with more, at least initially. I would, I would guess that we could end up with somewhere between five and 10 at the initial stages of autonomous vehicles, but then it would get you know, kind of peeled down to maybe two or three, kind of like our phones are now. I think that's, that's likely what we'll see in the next 10 years. Apple, however, for all we know, is pretty far behind when it comes to cars. This is something that Google has been working on for a very long time. Can Apple really catch up? I think they can because it's not like a hardware situation or even an automaker where you have to have all these suppliers and you have to have this whole network in place. If you've got the brain trust and the focus uh, on the technology side, you can get there pretty quickly. Uh, you got to be careful how you do it. You don't want to you know, take information from other companies that are already working on things. We know some other players out there are now you know, claiming that's what happened to them. But I think Apple has been working on this for years. They've kind of changed direction on how they want to execute it, but I don't feel like they're starting from ground zero at all. They've got a lot of work under their belt, not as much as Google, but a lot. Tim Cook also mentioned his excitement around electric cars. Morgan Stanley analyst Adam Jonas downgraded Tesla last May, and he doubled down when he heard these comments from Tim Cook saying that Tesla has a lot of competition ahead. Do you agree? I do. I agree that there are plenty of really well-funded, uh, long-standing players, long-standing on the tech side, long-standing on the automotive production side, and Tesla's still relatively a newcomer, and they're still trying to figure out how to have long-term funding that's sustainable. So they've got plenty of challenges to overcome that go way beyond just developing a self-driving car, whereas someone like Apple or General Motors, they can focus on this, and they've already got their you know, current business model in place. But Tesla already has cars on the road. Apple has nothing, as far as we know. Yeah, but Tesla's done that in an unsustainable way financially. You know, they, at some point, they have to make enough cars to be profitable. Uh, until then, they can make a lot of claims about how far along they are, but nothing looks sustainable. And truthfully, a lot of what they've got accomplished, a lot of other players can do as much or more right now, too. They don't make as much noise as Tesla does, but they're just as capable and just as far, as far along as Tesla is. And what about a company like GM out with the new Chevy Bolt? What does it mean for a more established automaker that is trying to take on uh, these tech giants? That's a great move for, for General Motors. They're in a really good position because ultimately you need the three major elements of this to work. You need the car, and hopefully it's an electric car with a lot of uh, internal space, and you need the technology that directs the car when there's no human involved. 
and GM's got the car and they've got a lot of the work on the technology and they can partner with someone like Waymo or Apple to get the rest of the way. The third leg, of course, is the regulations and the, and the government, you know, kind of helping it all come together like you talked about earlier. And that one is harder to predict because it could take a long time. But if those three things come together, things will happen quickly and GM is already a long way away, a long way along the race, you know, along this pathway in this race to get to the car. They've got a lot of things moving in the right direction right now today. All right. Well, Tim Cook certainly got the auto industry talking. Cox Automotive Senior Director of Content and Executive Publisher, Carl Brower. Carl, thank you so much for joining us. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. All episodes are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>